I wanted to start with uh, the piece that you wrote on managing compassionately. So there was a piece uh, Jeff wrote. Uh, if you do just a Google search for uh, managing compassionately, Jeff Weiner, uh, it's pretty easy to find. But in it, he really uh, argues and shares about why these two qualities, that's compassion and wisdom, are central components for leaders. And so I thought it would nice beginning would be just to share about why that actually feels important to you mm. and why kind of come out in a, in a very formal way through a blog post and kind of set yourself up as uh, a... Because sometimes people do it privately, but they're very uncomfortable sharing it publicly. Huh. Um, you, you must not <laughs> have that concern. No, no I, I wrote a post... Uh, that's, a good, that's a safe conclusion to reach. I, I wrote a post on uh, the LinkedIn platform, and I, I never really considered that being a private thing versus mm -hmm. a public thing. And as you mentioned it, I can I certainly understand it. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes people have a tendency when they hear softer skills like that mm -hmm. to roll their eyes a bit or feel like what relevance does that have to business. But uh, it really, for me, started uh, well over a decade ago, probably uh, around the year 2000, uh, maybe even a little earlier. And I read a book called The Art of Happiness, yeah. uh, Howard Cutler, and the teachings of the Dalai Lama. And uh, in the book, uh, among many other, uh, you know, really insightful elements and, and principles of the Dalai Lama, he talked about compassion, and he talked about the difference between compassion and empathy, mm -hmm. which, uh, to me, had always been synonymous. Mm -hmm. And uh, he used an example in the book about the fact that if you were walking along a trail and you came upon someone who uh, was uh, being crushed with a boulder on their chest. And I guess that must be something the Dalai Lama would stumble upon at some point. <laughs> One of those lifetimes. I don't think you're going to find that in uh, Silicon Valley. But in any rate, <laughs> uh, if you were to come upon somebody that uh, was suffocating by virtue of having a boulder on their chest, the empathetic reaction would be to feel exactly what they feel. Mm. And you'd be rendered uh, in a position where you couldn't help them. Mm -hmm. uh, because you'd be feeling the same suffocation they would be. Mm. Whereas compassion is a more objective form of empathy, and it mm. creates some space so that while you're seeing the world through their perspective, walking a mile in their shoes, you actually retain uh, your own sense of the world. Mm. And as a compassionate person, you could recognize that that individual was suffering and do everything within your power to alleviate their suffering. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a real eye-opener for me. And uh, I'd been in business for some time up until that point and uh, had been managing some people, but I just felt like compassion wasn't something I consciously was practicing. It wasn't something I mm -hmm. thought too much about. And it just started to enter into my worldview a little bit more back then. And so, you know, you fast forward many years, and as I took on more and more responsibility within uh, business, uh, I started to aspire to practice it more often and uh, at some point actually stumbled across a situation where I felt like <clears throat> somebody was not managing compassionately and became very obvious. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, a former colleague of mine. So when you were witnessing? Yeah, I, I, I was in a situation at work uh, prior to my current uh, role at LinkedIn where a former colleague was from time to time unfortunately undermining uh, someone on their team. Mm -hmm. And they would do so through disparaging remarks or, or jokes that were made at that person's expense in a, in a large group setting, a staff meeting. And it made everyone uncomfortable, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure the person that was doing it really recognized the damage that it was doing. And we were in a one-on-one -on -one situation, and I, I finally felt the need and compelled mm -hmm. to say something. And said, you know, the next time you feel like uh, making a joke at that person's expense or expressing anger or frustration, you should find a, a mirror mm -hmm. and do it to yourself. Because at the end wow. of the day, that person's in the role because you want them in the role. Right. And what you're doing is forcing your way of doing things, your approach, your way of thinking, your way of talking onto them. And at the end of the day, that person's in the role by virtue of your choice. And so if you're going to be frustrated with anyone, be frustrated with yourself for leaving them in the role and trying to expect them to do something they're not set up to be successful at. You should make a decision that they're not right for the role, in which case you should remove them, or play to their strengths, coach right. them in their areas where they can be improved upon. And he, he took it in, and he was very thoughtful about the whole thing, and uh, he said, well, thank you for that advice, I'll see. And a few weeks later, he came back, and he said, I have to tell you, uh, it kind of changed the way, not only I'm handling that person, but the way I'm approaching this. And as he was telling me this, I realized I was doing the exact same thing to someone on my wow. team. Wow. 
And in that Great. moment, negatively, uh, I was doing the exact yeah. same thing. I was, and it's something I think a lot of inexperienced executives do. First of all, it's a very human thing to project your own mm -hmm. perspective onto mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very, I think, common thing. And as a less experienced executive or a leader or for anyone in the audience that, that works with other people, the tendency will be to expect people to do things the way you do them. Yeah. It's very natural. And it's, it's not the right way to approach it. Yeah. You need to take a moment to manage compassionately. Put yourself in their shoes. Understand why they're coming with what they come with. Uh, what is their background? What is their baggage? What, mm. Where are their anxieties? What inspires them? Where are their strengths, their weaknesses? And that takes time, and it takes yeah. real investment. And the knee-jerk reaction is just to do things the way you would normally do them. Right. And that's right. going to create a lot of dissonance. And so from that moment going forward, I kind of decided that would be a first principle of management, wow. would be managing compassionately. Wow, wow. And so when... <laughs> <I'm sure agree. laughs> um, so how does that actually show up? Because when some people look at that from more of a traditional culture, they're like, well, that's great and lovely and, and nice. Um, but, you know, your job is to increase revenue as a CEO. Your job is to increase users as a CEO. How do, you, how do you put these two interests, which I'm sure you're interested in and focused on, but how do you, put, how do you make that a, a part of growing a business versus mm. just kind of a nice perk that you offer people on the side? Do you feel like it's actually a personal thing that you just do on the side or it's actually a central thing that actually helps you make a more effective, um, productive business environment? So I think the, the answer is multifaceted. Uh, for starters, I don't really think about what we do is creating revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about what we do is creating economic opportunity for our membership. And I, but, but as a applause <laughs> from this group. But as a CEO, isn't there, the board expects you to create revenue, no? Those two things, uh, if we're doing our jobs right, right. are naturally aligned. The okay. creation of long-term value is aligned with creating value for our membership, for our customers. Uh, and that ultimately creates value for the entire ecosystem with which we uh, operate or in which we operate. And it starts, you know, we're a very purpose-driven organization. Our vision is to create economic opportunity for every professional, where professional, very broadly defined, is someone that earns a living from their skill. Mm -hmm. There's 3.3 billion people in the global workforce, and we can't think of anything more profoundly or sustainable, sustainably valuable than creating economic opportunity for people and not only improving the quality of their lives as individuals, but the quality of their families' lives, and perhaps even more importantly, the quality of the lives that these people can in turn create economic opportunity for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it, we're going to create revenue if we right. do that right. well. Right. Uh, we're going to create long-term shareholder value as a public company if we do that well. So this notion of creating economic opportunity for people, this notion of creating opportunity and doing things for others, I think is very much aligned mm -hmm. with the concept of managing compassionately. So at, at a very high level, in terms of our vision, our purpose, I think there's alignment. Then, in terms of the day-to-day, -day, you have to reinforce it. It's not enough to just state yeah. it as a vision. Right. Frankly, it's not enough to even have it as your value proposition. Um, for us, it's practiced through our culture and through our values. Mm -hmm. and, and we take our culture and values very seriously, so much so uh, we've codified them. They were part of the filing when we went public. Uh, but we evaluate our team. Uh, we evaluate the performance of our managers, of every individual at the company, uh, in part by virtue of the way they lead. And the way we define leadership is not only the ability to inspire others to achieve shared objectives, uh, but the extent to which they walk the walk on our culture and values. Mm -hmm. And two elements of our values that are, are very germane to this are, one, relationships matter. And whenever we say it, we say, in other words, managing compassionately. Mm -hmm. And the other is being open, honest, and constructive. Mm -hmm. You can be open and honest and not constructive. And right. a big part of that is, again, practicing compassion. And we walk that walk. It's not enough mm -hmm. to just say those are our values or yeah. put them up on posters around the office right. or create those little <laughs> laminated cards or the mouse pads. And no offense to any company that does that. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it, it's not about talking the talk. It's about walking the walk. And had you asked me about culture and values and their importance to an organization yeah. six, seven years ago, I would have rolled my eyes. Yeah. It was the same thing you were talking about earlier, which is why people don't typically talk about compassion. It's like, whatever, let's right. just get back to work. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah. just make the next sale, right, right? right? And culture and values, at least speaking for LinkedIn, have become perhaps our most important competitive advantage. And if it's not yeah. number one, it's certainly getting there. Mm -hmm. And it's what's enabled us 
to grow at the rate we've been able to grow. We, we now reach uh, you know, over 200 million members on a global basis, members in 200 countries and territories around the world. We're in 26 cities. That kind of expansion would not have been possible without a very clear understanding and sense of who we are as an organization. Yeah. And yeah. practicing that and manifesting that and walking that walk every day. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. I don't want to pause for a second. Um, so it's rare. I think, for a CEO, which is part of my interest in you, it's rare for a CEO of a company, probably one of the fastest growing Silicon Valley companies, to have that vision. And um, I'm just pretty impressed that, that, uh, that you can have that, personally. So very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. And so how does it, how does it take form? So let's say... Um, it's one thing to tell, all right, we're going to uh, staff, we're now, uh, compassion is now important. <laughs> um, That's it, and we're done. <laughs> right, we're done. It's that simple. <laughs> it's that simple. Uh, there'll be a memo at four, uh, please read it. Um, and so if I'm like, all right, Jeff, this sounds good, um, what do I do next? I have the idea, it's kind of interesting to me. Um, what kind of direction, if any, do you give the employees, or how, do, how does it take form so it becomes... Not just an idea, but actually a practice and lived and embodied and brought in. One of the things I've noticed uh, by virtue of the position that I'm in and the, the growth trajectory of LinkedIn is the evolution that I think uh, leaders and executives and managers uh, need to undergo as the company grows. In order to scale, there's at least two continuums that, that we think quite a bit about. Uh, one of them has on one end problem solving, on the other end is coaching. And then the other continuum on one end is tax, tactical execution, on the other end is thinking strategically. And with regard to this notion of practicing and manifesting things like managing compassionately, it, it's really about coaching. Uh, you got to take the time to coach. It's, it, you can't be just solving people's problems for them uh, when you're starting to achieve a certain kind of scale. Uh, because it doesn't scale. As you grow, you know, when I first joined LinkedIn, we were 338 people. Today, we're roughly 3,500 people, so over 10x growth in the last four years. That growth wouldn't be possible. We wouldn't be able to execute if I was just solving people's problems mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you have to begin that transition. That's what you're doing when you're two people and a dog in your garage and you're building a prototype. Right. You're solving your problems and you're executing as quickly as possible so you can build the prototype and generate the financing. And once you've got the financing, you're going to start hiring up. So you get mm -hmm. to those 15 people, uh, you start to, to produce a product, that product is released on the web, and all of a sudden you've got a success and it starts to scale. Now you've got to grow from 15 people to 150 people. Mm -hmm. And when you reach that kind of escape velocity, it requires a very different approach in terms of how you're leading, how you're managing. And if you're just solving people's problems for them, mm -hmm. And by virtue of the fact that you're in that leadership role, you're probably pretty good at solving problems. Mm -hmm. That's how you got to that mm -hmm. position to begin with. You've got to take the time to pause and coach. And the challenge with that is that coaching takes a lot of time, mm -hmm. a lot of time. It requires you to understand why the team or that person has the problem that they do. It requires a lot of questions and active listening. It requires understanding the baggage that person brings mm -hmm. to the table, mm -hmm. what it is that they ultimately want to accomplish, playing to their strengths, coaching them in the areas that they need help. And that takes so much time, mm -hmm. way more time than just solving the problem yeah, for yeah, them. So the natural yeah, tendency yeah. is always to kind of just do the knee-jerk thing. And so when it comes to something like managing compassionately, you've got to take the time to coach it. Okay. You've got to look for the circumstances and the examples where people are not being compassionate, where they're projecting their own perspective onto someone, or worse still, they're just assuming someone is bringing nefarious intention to the discussion, which is something that, you know, unfortunately is reality. Yeah. It's, well, this person disagrees with me in this business setting. Clearly, they're being political. It's mm -hmm. just about their mm -hmm. own motivations and advancing their career, their team's uh, prospects or uh, they are ignorant and they, they don't have the information they need. They're not as smart as, as we are who have the position that opposes their position. These are all very pejorative kind of negative assumptions that I think a lot of people have a tendency to make in those settings. And so when you see that, when you are coaching as opposed to solving problems, the, the problem solver is just going to try to settle the debate. Right, right. When you're in a coaching frame of mind, you're actually asking the questions, why are you bringing that perspective to the table? Mm -hmm. 
are you aware of the following facts? Mm -hmm. And you start to get into a rhythm where you are walking a mile in their shoes. Mm -hmm. And that can be practiced. Mm -hmm. And once you start bringing that to people's attention, they recognize the benefits of that. Because think about how inefficient it is to go through those constant debates and the toxicity that's generated when people are assuming that the other person across the table is ill-intended. Yeah. And now flip that, where you're putting yourself in their shoes and asking yourself, why do they have the opinion that they have? And is there an opportunity here to coach them? Is there an opportunity for me to learn where they're coming from? How can we best meet in the middle? And not only by calling that out are you enabling people to manage compassionately and then take that with them throughout their daily practice mm -hmm. in work, but it just creates far more productivity. Yeah far more efficiency, far more effectiveness when it comes to these kinds of discussions. So you just got to constantly call that stuff yeah. out and you reinforce it and that way you manifest it. Wow. 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 I have to pause again. <laughs> yeah. the, pause, the pause, I guess, is the Wisdom 2.0 version of the applause meter. Uh, something like that, yeah. So the more <laughs> silence there is, that's a good thing. You know, like the pause, let me take that in. Yeah, take I had to take that out. It's a good thing. To take that out. Uh, and so because this is Wisdom 2.0 and because of your blog post, even though it says managing compassionately, it has the two elements of compassion and wisdom. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit or have you just have a chance to see where you see that other um, piece fitting in. Sure. And how that um, shows up. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I guess my first principle or, or personal vision statement, if you will, uh, is to expand the world's collective wisdom and compassion. And I didn't just design that for this event, uh, <laughs> given that I, I think that's kind of like the tagline of the whole thing. Uh, but that, that's something that I've been thinking quite a bit about for several years. And actually going back even further than that, uh, about five, six, seven years, uh, I was fascinated with the, the concept of collective wisdom. I, I've long been interested in education, educational reform, and it was one of the things that counterintuitively to some led me into business with the belief being that if I could amass enough influence and resources, I could actually make a, a real difference in the world in that respect. But I grew up, my dad you know, worked at CBS, the television broadcast network for uh, many years and I grew up uh, very interested in media and was exposed to the, the web uh, pretty early on in its evolution and so saw the, the power of digital in terms of leveling the the playing field, democratizing the flow of information. I was drawn to digital media. I was drawn to the search industry. And one of the things I was fascinated by with regard to search was that a company like Google that was so dominant in search was very focused on information, so much so that it was part of their mission statement, which was to organize the world's information, make it more accessible, more valuable. And in a classic information retrieval continuum, information plays a role, and it's an important role, uh, but it's not the be-all, end-all. And so along that continuum, you have data, you have information, you have knowledge, you have understanding, and you have wisdom. And I was always fascinated by uh, what would be possible if you could go as far out along that continuum as you could. And so as much value as collecting the world's information was generating, I thought how much more value could there be if that information was placed into greater context, creating knowledge, and then greater context still creating understanding, and then take it to its end state and wisdom. And while this was happening, while I was paying attention to these trends and, and the emergence of, of the search industry and its power, it was impacting the world, there was a, another uh, trend emerging, and it was the rise of, of social platforms that were connecting at first millions and tens of millions, now hundreds of millions, if not billions of people around the world in milliseconds, and the collective intelligence that was possible as a result of these connections. And the convergence between these, these two things, the way in which uh, social interaction and connections could actually accelerate a move from data and information towards knowledge, greater understanding, and wisdom. And so I was fascinated by that. And I thought as I was transitioning uh, from my role in Yahoo uh, into my next role, how exciting it would be to take on a company or start something that would be focused on expanding the world's collective wisdom. And so that was the theme I was really fascinated by, and I was sharing this 
uh, with a very good friend of mine, a guy named Fred Kaufman. Some of you may know that name. Uh, wrote, <laughs> I love the applause yeah. here. That's all right. You, uh, so Fred wrote a book called Conscious Business. Fred's one of the most enlightened people personally that I know. He's a friend. He's a mentor. He started a company called Axiolint that does leadership coaching. Really unique person, unique human being. Uh, a, a accountant by training, but uh, really likes to practice uh, Buddhist principles in his life. We were out to dinner as I was transitioning out of Yahoo, and I was sharing with him uh, this vision to expand the world's collective wisdom. And we were at dinner, and we had uh, a few Belgian beers, great beer, Chimay, <laughs> for those that like Belgian beer. And so I said, yeah, you know, Fred, I'm really focused on expanding the world's collective wisdom. And he paused, and he said, that's, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. And he said, but bear in mind that wisdom without compassion is ruthlessness, and compassion without wisdom is folly. And I was like, whoa. And I said, uh, that's, that's pretty profound stuff. Is that, is that the Dalai Lama? He said, no, that's me after a couple of Belgian beers. <laughs> and so, uh, all kidding aside, we talked about that for the remainder of the evening. By the end of the dinner, I said, I, I have to tell you, Fred, um, every now and again, you hear something that just makes so much sense and feels so right. You don't really need to debate it. Or, or ruminate over it. I said, I'm going to revise that statement, and that's going to be my personal vision. It's to expand the world's collective wisdom and compassion. So. Wow. And soon after that, the job at, at uh, LinkedIn was offered, or you already knew you were going there? Uh, very shortly after that. So at the time, Fred and I were talking. I was still trying to figure out what I was going to be doing next. I was in EIR at both Excel and Greylock, and uh, that was a wonderful role where I had exposure to uh, both of these uh, really amazing venture capital firms, their portfolio companies, and had a chance to work a little bit with their visionary founders and some of the partners on investment theses. And uh, Greylock was an early stage investor in LinkedIn. And uh, at the time, they were thinking about making a leadership transition. And Reid Hoffman, the, the founder uh, and the, the chairman, uh, asked if I'd be interested in uh, playing a role. And so one thing led to another. I ended up at LinkedIn. But it's interesting the way all of this comes together because for someone that was interested first in education reform, which is really about democratizing access to information, and then advancing that over time to start thinking about wisdom and compassion and ending up in a place where our focus is creating economic opportunity, yeah. these things are very much related. Yeah. They, they work hand in hand. I mean, at the end of the day, what's the point of education and democratizing the flow of information if people don't have access to economic opportunity, and it's through economic opportunity that people can better themselves and have the time and have the energy to invest in thinking about the kinds of themes that we're talking about today. So mm. to me, it's, it's so interesting the way it all yeah. kind of converges and worked out. Excellent, excellent. Pop in again. <laughs> so what is wisdom to you? I think wisdom is the ability to discern right from wrong. Mm -hmm. and honing that over time and experience, your own personal experience, and then uh, the ability to actively listen and learn from people who have greater experience than you do. Mm -hmm. And it seems that a key, just from my uh, sense, it seems that a key kind of component to all this is awareness. Mm -hmm. That if I'm not aware of the projections I'm making, if I'm not aware of the notions that I'm building about this person, if I'm um, making up stories in my head about what their, what their actually intentions are without checking them out, um, so it seems like there's this component in there that teaches people self-awareness, but then awareness of self and then awareness of others, and that there is a connection that's, that's possible when that awareness is, is present. Yeah. Is, am I on the right framework or, or less so? Yeah, you know, when you talk about awareness, it's interesting because you don't typically hear it explicitly discussed in the context of leadership, but I've, I've got to tell you that I think one of the things that all uh, really strong leaders have is extraordinary awareness. Mm. And what I've noticed is uh, these individuals have the ability uh, to read and take the pulse of a room, whether it's talking to one individual, uh, their staffs of 10 or 12 people, or a group of 1,800, and to be able in real time, while expressing themselves and while communicating and while thinking, to be able to, to take in what's happening. Yeah. And that awareness enables them to course correct. Mm. And that is such an important part of leadership, is that course yeah. correction. Yeah. In every moment, ideally, I don't know that people yeah. always have that luxury, but moment to moment, hour to hour, day to day, 
quarter to quarter, year to year. It's being able to understand your environment, uh, the competitive landscape, the technical landscape, the talent landscape, the people you're working with, what motivates them, and to be able to course correct. And yeah. that starts with awareness. So mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more in that okay. respect. Okay. And in my sense is, what, what do you see is happening in terms of the growing interest in this whole domain? That for one, you can be a CEO and you can talk about wisdom and compassion as a core tenet. And, and, and you can still stay a CEO. <laughs> and uh, th there can be 1,700, 1,800 people here today all coming together not to hear about the latest new you know, uh, technology innovation per se, mm -hmm. but actually interested in wisdom and compassion and, and awareness within the culture. Um, what's your read on it? Do you have a sense that there is this, this larger expectation for what business should be or could be or larger expectation for what our society can be, or how do you see this movement from where we've been, which it seems like a very much an information age, mm. and what it feels like to me is we're moving into this other chapter that's actually about wisdom and compassion. But I'd love to get your read on it, both from your position at LinkedIn, but also your position just looking at what the, what's going on in the culture. So I do think going back to that, that continuum, that information retrieval continuum, I do think there's a natural progression there. Mm -hmm. And at each step of the way, it's about greater context. Mm -hmm. And context requires, to some extent, time. Mm -hmm. uh, time to gather the context, time to process the context, time to share the context. And I think as uh, more and more economies around the world, developing economies, developed economies, uh, continue to grow, one of the byproducts of that is creating more time within a society. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a natural progression there. Mm -hmm. I think that's being accelerated by virtue of technology. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was talking earlier about Google, but think about what search has meant to the world yeah. in terms of providing really this collective form of memory, yeah. where historically, yeah. how would you access that kind of information, that repository? You'd need to either study it and remember it, or be with someone who possessed it, or have access to a book that had the information you needed right in that moment. And for the entire planet to now have access to all of the world's information, uh, which is milliseconds away mm -hmm. after doing a query, as long as you have a device that can connect you, and increasingly that's the case. Uh, I think that's certainly hastened and accelerated uh, a move. I think it also goes back to what we were talking about earlier with regard to the rise of social platforms, and whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or uh, many other social platforms within particular niches. But you take a step back and you think about the fact that literally hundreds of millions of people around the world uh, can connect again in milliseconds. Yeah. And the scale and the speed with which we can connect and tie and bind humanity, the way in which we share, I mean, seemingly everything, and yeah. perhaps oversharing <laughs> at times, but data information, knowledge, understanding, wisdom, insight, intelligence. It's never been conceivable what's yeah. happening right now yeah. in the world. And so I think these trends are converging, and I think one of the byproducts is a greater appreciation for mm -hmm. wisdom, mm -hmm. is a greater appreciation for compassion, and really the combination of those two things, and yeah. not thinking about them uh, one at the exclusion of the other. Yeah. It just seems that with all that information comes this other huge challenge, <laughs> which is how much of that just ends up filling the mind such that I'm actually less present and less connected to my own body, less, connect, less, less, less self less, uh, aware. And um, I sometimes think of it when I'm on the computer and I'm just downloading data, I'm not actually very tuned in to uh, my body. I'm not actually very aware. And I feel like a little bit it's like trying to give wisdom teachings to someone who's sprinting by you. Mm. Right? I mean, they kind of hear it, but it doesn't really land just because there's so much, so much data moving through. Yeah. So I feel like one of the big questions, at least for me, is how do we have this world of seemingly endless data and, and sharing, which is absolutely needed and beneficial, but then also harness this other kind of intelligence that comes from looking in and from uh, some kind of self-awareness that really can only be had when we're with ourselves mm. or when we're with a dear friend or with a, a person when there's a real human connection. Um, so I don't know how that's going to show itself, <laughs> and if you, you don't have ideas, that's fine. But, but just the balance between the, a very digital life, yeah. but then also a very a non-digital life, and the two, the, the two can live harmoniously with each other. Yeah. 
it's interesting. You, you started by saying the balance between the two, and then you went to living harmoniously. And when I hear the word balance, uh, by virtue of what I do, it's typically in the context of work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I heard Jeff Bezos talk about at one point, which really stuck with me, was the fact that that's the question he's most commonly asked, is how does he strike the right balance between work and life, given what he does. And he said he doesn't try to strike a balance. He tries to find the right harmony mm. and to integrate the two, because mm -hmm. Amazon is a part of who he is. Yeah. So is his family, et cetera. And it's not necessarily, balance implies 50-50. And I think mm -hmm. for different people, you're going to get a different mix. And yeah. so it's really about finding the right harmony and the right points of integration. And with regard to this information overload, you know, it, it's interesting, as you were talking, I hadn't quite thought about it in the context that you were describing it, but human beings, as we all know, are extraordinarily adaptive, you know, as a race. And I would hope that perhaps our homeostatic condition would evolve such that as information becomes increasingly prevalent, our bodies, our minds, our consciousness becomes increasingly aware of when we reach overload by virtue of the way we feel, the stress, uh, the toll it takes on our bodies, and can find a way to harmonize that, mm -hmm. to put the device down, to yeah. walk away from the computer, and to develop a practice, whatever works for the individual, whether it's working out, meditation, mm -hmm. going for a run, mm -hmm. whatever that is. And that over time, the hope would be we'd evolve in such a way where those things would be integrated so we can get the best yeah. of both worlds right. as opposed yeah. to allowing this information overload to really overrun our lives. Yeah. Yeah. And make us more reactive and less compassionate and mm -hmm. those things. So uh, last question and then we'll um, have some uh, time for questions. Uh, so I want to jump ahead some years and imagine uh, you're no longer with LinkedIn. Uh, that was a chapter in your life that was beautiful and and uh, and you're um, retired and kind of in the in the later years of your well how let's say how many years are we going <laughs> let's say in the later years of your life okay. um, what do you think is going to really matter to you and what kind of impact would you want to have uh, looking back uh, is there a sense of uh, this kind of um, I know I'm I feel like I'm just asking a question that's not completely clear. But, uh, but what I guess I feel like I want to get to is it's, it's easy when we're in a certain particular role to be really uh, focused on that role, which is important. Um, but sometimes what I like to ask is imagine yourself on your deathbed and you're, taking, you're saying goodbye to your name, goodbye to your bank account, goodbye to your friends, goodbye to the body. And um, what kind of uh, impact would you have wanted said you have made? Or what kind of life would you have said you have wanted to live? So I think it uh, exists on a few different dimensions. I, I think it ties back to one of the things we were talking about earlier, which is this kind of personal vision. Yeah. And I, I hope to have played some small part in expanding the world's collective wisdom and compassion. Mm. I think that'd be a, a really valuable thing yeah. to have been a part of and participated mm. in. I think, you know, at a less abstract level, uh, I think to have been happy, Mm. And, uh, you know, sometimes that will generate the eye rolls. Yeah. It's like happiness, whatever, sure. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, it took me 40 years to realize this. Uh, what makes me happy is actually fairly straightforward. It's looking forward to going to work in the morning and looking forward to coming home at night. And wow. if I can live my life wow. where that's the case, wow. I'll, I'll be happy and, yeah. and very fulfilled and again it comes back to this notion of mm -hmm. harmony and, and integration and you know the, the most important thing to me uh, of all the things that we've discussed is my family it's my wife yeah. our two little girls yeah. being the best husband I can be being the best father I can yeah. be and that comes first the the role I play in society is built on top of the foundation that we have at home wow. And so those are the things that I, I hope to be able to look back on and, and say I was able to fulfill. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks. Uh, so we have some time for questions. We're probably not going to get to everybody who has a question, just to give you a heads up. Uh, is there a, uh, the mic set up, or can the mic get set up briefly? So um, a just one uh, thing, uh, encouragement to keep the questions 
uh, brief and to the point so that uh, we can get through as many as we can. Hello, check, test. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm wondering if you have any specific ways that you can suggest bringing wisdom and mindfulness into education for, for the whole system, the students, administrators, teachers, K to 12 specifically. Sure. Thank you. So uh, thank you for asking that because uh, between uh, the interest in education reform and then uh, that first principle of expanding the world's collective wisdom and compassion, it is something I've given some thought to. And uh, one of the things I contemplated when I was younger was whether or not uh, compassion could be taught. And I didn't know. And just uh, serendipitously uh, was watching uh, television one night and I stumbled across uh, a documentary. And it was a PBS uh, frontline documentary, Bill Moyer. It was called A Class Divided. Anyone in the audience familiar with that documentary? Very few people. So I, st I never would have found it if it weren't for this kind of very fortuitous moment. But it was the story of uh, a teacher in elementary school in the segregated South. And uh, the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, she felt like she needed to do something. And she divided her class of all white students into two halves, one light eyes and the other dark eyes. And on day one, she said that one half of the class would have all of the privileges and the other half of the class would be subjugated to them. And this went on, and it was interesting to watch the response and the reaction, but where it got really interesting was when she flipped it on day two. And uh, kids mm. were beside themselves. And you got to watch it to fully appreciate what took place, but it turns out they followed the students, and a couple of decades later they caught up to them, and they interviewed them, and pretty much to a person they were members of the civil rights movement. And uh, in that moment, I recognized that compassion can be taught. And not only can it be taught, it should be taught. And it should be required in our curriculum. Mm -hmm. And it should be part of the syllabus. And, you know, I would, I would love to see the day. It's so interesting to me when we first started talking you were saying, you know, what did it take for you to be talking about compassion in a public setting? Mm -hmm. And that's coming from you. I mean, right. yeah, you're yeah. the guy who organized <laughs> this event, right? So you live, eat, and breathe this, and you believe it with every fiber of your being. But for the rest of society, uh, clearly, uh, there's still a long ways to go. But we've got to get to the point where we're not thinking about compassion as a soft skill or something that generates eye-rolling. It should be taught with the same sense of urgency and gravitas, the same math skills or verbal skills. And if you think about it, what could be more important yeah. as a legacy to leave this generation of children than the ability to be compassionate? So, you know, that would be one way of thinking about it. I just want to take off from the last thing. One of the last things you said was that one of your purposes is to be the best husband you can be. And uh, the, the premise behind our startup is really based on the same things. To premises that in the final analysis on our deathbed, so to speak, uh, what will make us most happy in life is how well we loved and are loved by those closest to us. And so we're gambling that the future of technology is going to be very much oriented toward using technology for those most important relationships uh, in our lives, especially with the most important adult in our lives. Do you share that that's the future of technology, and, and what are some of your thoughts and feelings about that? Four words. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> using, techno using technology to make that happen. Using so anything. You can, you can build anything you want that uh, will help manifest that. <laughs> Uh, but for me, uh, that's the golden rule. So my wife's actually here. I mean, she's <laughs> up and right over here. She's down with that. She's and, down with uh, that. you know, I was talking earlier about the importance of, of building a firm foundation. Uh, 
my wife is that foundation for me, for our girls, for our home, and everything that I'm capable of doing within the workplace starts first and foremost, or in terms of philanthropic endeavors, it, it starts at home. It starts with the foundation we create. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I learned that expression several years ago, and it's right up there with uh, the, the, the notion of uh, wisdom and compassion in terms of, of import. In, in seriousness, uh, on the answer to your question as to whether or not you can build products, technology, etc., that very same night I was talking to Fred Kaufman about expanding the world's collective wisdom, uh, one of the things I didn't mention was the fact that I was trying to brainstorm with Fred how you could create a product or a service, how you could commercialize it. And we were racking our brains. It was actually a discussion that took place over uh, many weeks, if not months. And the conclusion was somewhat interesting. It was that it's going to be pretty hard uh, to put com wisdom and compassion in a box and sell it. But one of the things that I hypothesized at the time was that maybe one day I could be part of a company where I could influence people. And by virtue of thinking about collective wisdom and compassion, we could help manifest that within the company. And that if every employee of a company was manifesting that, it would ultimately come through in the products and services that that company was offering. And the customers would be on the receiving end of that. And so that's the way in which I think about it today. And that's not to say you can't commercialize it, you can't create technology around it, uh, but that's just the way I approach it. Great. Thank you. So I want to thank Jeff for uh, hanging out with us for the first time. Really, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, and I, I, did, I, didn't, I, didn't ask them, uh, I didn't ask them what the uh, one book is on your bedside table, but uh, we could uh, share it if you want. It's The Art of Happiness. It's been there uh, for roughly 13 years. I don't read it uh, very often, but just having it there. And, and seeing it, uh, it, it's very helpful. That's beautiful. Cool. Thank you.